We have uh, a soldier, a private soldier, as you would have appeared in the 1770s. We have the modern day, post 2000. We have two riflemen. Ladies and gentlemen, 230 years, British soldier. So right at the very end. <laughs> At the, well, the beginning of time, not, the, not quite, but the beginning of our time. We have uh, a soldier, a private soldier, as he would have appeared in the 1770s, so His Majesty's 33rd Regiment in particular. So there's a brief overview, he's armed with flintlock musket, muzzle loader, there we go, nice white uh, cross belt, nice bright red coat, bayonet at his uh, side and a cop tap as well. So this is the soldier that would have been fighting in the American Wars of Independence, the Revolutionary Wars, exactly. So, 1770s. There we go. Oh, thank you very much. Do clap. feel free to clap because <laughs> all the living historians are here on their own. So, <laughs> well, we're gonna move from the red, red coat to the green jacket now. 60th, so the 5th Battalion, 60th Regiment. So armed with a rifle, the 1st Battalion in the British Army to be clothed in a green jacket. So still sticking with the flintlock, um, rifled barrel, unlike the musket, which is smooth bore. Again, muzzle loader, black powder, and uh, in particular for this rifle is a, a sword, sword bayonet. So uh, cap slightly changed. The British Army's first proper attempt, shall we say, at uh, a camouflage to a degree. Throw a shot. Keep it with the rifles theme, the 2nd Battalion, 95th. So, very, very similar to the 5th, 60th, but unique in their own way. So, again, they have the, the Baker rifle, the infantry rifle. So, still flintlock, muzzle loader. Um, we also have the sword bayonet still. Uh, if you want to spin around, actually, draw it back. The best side is the knapsack, mess tins, uh, great coat, and Inez is undressed uniform, cartridge pouch, haversack with his day's rations in, and a canteen as well. And that's the sword bayonet just here. Excellent. This is the British soldier as he would have appeared, or the British rifleman as he would have appeared at Waterloo in 1815. Okay, next up, 68th. So, again, 1815, most, if not all, British soldiers were clothed in the traditional red coat of the Battle of Waterloo. Obviously, exceptions being the green jacket. Uh, rather than a rifle, a uh, smoothbore musket, so India pattern, still flintlock, black powder. Um, again, all the accoutrements on the soldier as well. It's a spin. Very natural, that one. <laughs> um, knapsack still, with always bits and bobs in. Uh, rather than black leather work, like the rifleman, we've got uh, pipe blade leather instead, so a nice cross target on the chest. <laughs> and cartridge pouch as well, and the uh, 1812 cap with the green feather, or green plume, I should say, indicates light infantryman. Thank you very much. So, kind of continuation of the rifles theme here, <laughs> we have a uh, rifle, rifle brigade from the Crimean War. So, the British Army up to this point, pretty much on the whole, was armed with smoothbore weapons. But this kind of marked the turning point where the British Army was turning to the whole of the army being armed with rifles. So, the three band Enfield, rather than a flintlock mechanism, percussion cap much more reliable in the field and uh, again still muzzle loader with black powder. It is a spin as well. You can see all the accoutrements are pretty much the same as the Napoleonic period to a degree. So knapsack, here we've got the framed nice sort of uh, rectangle there with all his bits and bobs in, blanket grey coat, mess tins on the top, again all black leather work, uh, the continuation of the rifle speed and he got all his rations in his haversack and his canteen as well and then his sword bayonet <laughs> yeah, go on, yeah. 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 Don't encourage 
Martin. The rowdy one, this one is. Okay, next up. We're moving into the realms of the Zulu Wars now. So if anyone's ever seen a film, Zulu, there's one. Someone's seen it. I've seen it a number of times. It's Easter. Yeah, but watched the film Zulu. 300 times. There you go. 300 times. So, the Martini Henry. So it's a breech loader. So moving into the realms of uh, a proper cartridge rather than a paper sort of made up cartridge now. So lever action. Round goes in the breech, closes the breech, ready to foil. The foil rate's getting much quicker now. Much more reliable system as well. However, infantry of the line, so you're sticking with the red, red coat or red jacket, white leather work, different carriage system. And they can give us a spin as well. He's in a fairly light marching order, so he's got his great coat, I believe it is, wrapped up there with uh, mess tins on the top, so pretty much nothing is really changing from the Napoleonic era. The, ne the necessaries are all still there, it works, so why change it? Um, and then the, the canteen is slightly different rather than being a blue circle, you've got your uh, wooden sort of uh, water bottle instead. And of course, bayonet and have a sack as well. <laughs> Excellent. Wanted to double check that. So, same period, but these are this chap is a rifle volunteer. So, armed with the same weapon, I believe. Yes, Martini Henry still. So, these are the 95th, 5th, 60th, plus 40 years, essentially. So, he's in light infantry rifle tactics at the time. Uh, these are volunteers. So, still clad in green, but you'll notice. This is different to the, the red coat that we have. So even though it's the same period, most of the British Army was in red, but the continuation is still there lurking in the background of moving into uh, green. Just a spin as well. Don't want to leave your own. You can see, got his sword bayonet, have a sack, and he's got his uh, blanket there as well for night time. So it should be a very light marching order just to see him through 24 hours. Excellent. And now, I'll hand you over to the very incapable hands of Mr. Peter Neal from Living History UK. Okay, so we're now moving to the First World War. Hold your one step forward, come on down. Grab equipment on because he wants ease of movement around the trench. Especially being a uh, colour sergeant as well, he's going to be a little bit off the front line. So his need of webbing isn't going to be as essential as it would be, say, a platoon sergeant. But he's also, at this moment in time, a Sergeant Major, because Company Sergeant Major isn't invented until next year, I believe it, well, in 1916. So, he's armed with his SMLE, which is short magazine, the end rifle, the most advanced rifle on the battlefield at this time. He's also got his black veil, because he's just recently encountered a new chemical warfare, okay? So, which is gas. So he has his black veil, so he's only, so gas warfare has been in full swing for around about a month at this point, so it's very, very early on. He has two bandoliers of ammunition, so he's currently carrying about 100 rounds worth of ammunition. No helmet yet, so he's got the new Gore Blimey, which is all the winter trench cap. Also, he's moving onward from actual gaiters and leather gaiters that we've seen over the past 100 years beforehand. He's now wearing putty gaiter, so he's wearing putties, which is an Indian word meaning bandage. So that is to do the same thing as what a gaiter can do, but it's now a wrap around his legs. Thank you, soldier. We're now moving into the following year of 1916. So what you see is one of Kitchener's soldiers on the Battle of the Somme in July of 1916. So he's still armed with his short magazine, Lee Enfield Rifle, but he has now got the newfangled helmet. So he now has a helmet to wear to go into battle. Something he's also got as well is his web equipment. Now this web equipment was originally used as an emergency stopgap, but it did find its way onto the Western Front, because where the normal regular army were using canvas equipment, 
leather equipment made its appearance. So you'll see a lot of soldiers in Kitchener's Army on the Somme onwards wearing the 14 pattern webbing equipment. He's also got gas warfare has also evolved. Turn to your side. In here is his PH hood, meaning phenate hexamine. So that is a hood that goes over his head with two eyepieces and a flutter valve for him to breathe out of. On to the back, he has his haversack. Now this haversack in full marching order would go around to his side, was only designed to carry his rations. But at this point in 1916, they're starting to put their personal items into it. So when he goes into action, it's now on his back. And you've got his mess tins hanging off the back to save space, where he could also put other items so he can carry more stuff with him. So moving forward 20 years, this is the sold of potentially his father would have carried 25 years before and in the First World War. Exactly the same rifle. However, his uniform's now changed. He now has the 37 pattern uh, web equipment, khaki serge, jack tunic, trousers. It's all functionality. So he's got two breast pockets, a map pocket. Also, no more putties anymore. We now have an anklet. On the front, he has his box respirator, which is the Mark II. So the Mark I was created at the end of the First World War. So we now move on to the Mark II that only came in very close to the start of the Second World War. So up until that point, they were still using the same one. Turn around. His haversack is on his back. Uh, again, like the First World War web equipment, it would have been on his side, but this actually has a lot more stuff in it. So where his large pack will carry his great coat and other accoutrements and things. It is, he's got his mess tins, his wash wall, his housewife, loads and loads of stuff going on in this bag. And on the top, this is his anti-gas cape. So in the event of a gas attack, he would put his respirator on, he would also drop this and wear it like a great big overcoat, and that's supposed to protect him from chemicals. So they say. <laughs> but you usually find a lot of men using them as raincoats, because that was really all they were good for. Now for something completely different. <laughs> As the Dunkirk campaign was didn't go quite to plan, Britain was in a very, very back against the wall situation. A call went out for volunteers. All these volunteers were able-bodied men who couldn't necessarily be in the regular reserve or regular or reserve army. So they called on normal civilians. And that was the creation of the LDV, the Local Defence Volunteers. And this is a Local Defence Volunteer. As we can see from this Local Defence Volunteer, he'd have served in the First World War like many of them did. He's basically just come out, he's got his own shotgun, and in the early days of this, you, some of them would just be carrying pikes. Because they were, like I said, they were trying to get stuff together. But these blokes would have been the last hope, basically. Quite literally, <laughs> backs against the wall, last hope, because we had nothing um, until we could try and rebuild the army once again. But then very quickly, it evolved. The local defence volunteers then evolved to the Home Guard. As you can see, he's more soldier-like now. He's got his own web equipment, which was unique to the Home Guard. He's issued with a rifle. He's also got a service box respirator, helmet, turn around, respirator, helmet, so he's looking very, very armified. Turn to the left. <laughs> so at this point now, the Home Guard, if the Germans had have invaded, they had defended key points. Their job was to hold the Germans up for as long as possible till we could put in a counter-attack. So, we got things like Dad's Army, made famous by Dad's Army, but the reality of what these blokes were going to be doing, if the Germans ever did come, would have been very, very, um, what's the word? Difficult. Difficult. A very <laughs> difficult situation. And they were also expected to hold to the last man as well. Because for them, retreat was not an option. So, uh, there we go. That is the Home Guard of 1940. A brand new concept came into play in the uh, 
latter years of World War II, sort of 41, we now see paratroopers. And here is a paratrooper. <laughs> yeah, leave it on. Don't deploy it. Oh, <laughs> oh! <laughs> he has also got his new issue number four rifle, which is a cheaper, easier to manufacture version of its uh, predecessor, the short magazine, the Enfield rifle. So this is what the British soldier is being issued from this point on. However, both rifles will still be used side by side until the end of the war. So our paratrooper, he has his oversmock, his Denison smock, which also is his sort of emblem of airborne forces. So he's unique to them. So he's got his oversmock in there. He'd have uh, grenades uh, in these little pockets down here. And inside here, he'd have his small pack and things like that. In here is the famous leg bag, so everything else went into there. So as he jumped out the aircraft, once the shoot deployed, he'd drop his bag and come to the ground. <laughs> Flutter down, if you will. Also a very unique helmet. So where the rest of the army are using the Mark II helmet, they have now got the paratrooper helmet. There's going to be at least four different designs throughout the war. This is just one of them. This is the Mark II. And it's also looking very modern. So if you look at a modern day helmet and how it's designed, it's the design is very, very similar. Do a little spin. Oh, I thought it was attached to you then. <laughs> <laughs> and here's his parachute. So soon, so that would obviously open up and he would flutter down. Um, and that would just get dumped. So as soon as he landed, it would come off. Same with the smock, everything get dumped. Everything else he had in his bag will go on and he'll just disappear. So that is the paratro British paratrooper of World War II. Because in World War II, although during the First World War, the tank made its first appearance on the battlefield. However, it's in World War II that the tank regiment really get their spurs, so to speak. So this soldier here is a tank commander in the Northwest Europe campaign. Why? Because he's already wearing his ribbon for North Africa. So he would have been a veteran of the North African Tunisian campaign, potentially Italy as well, and they get pulled back because 7th Armoured were pulled back to go and invade Normandy. So he would have been in the Normandy campaign. As you see, he has a pistol. What else you got? That's all you got. That's about it. <laughs> Fight light, literally. Everything else yeah, everything's all on the vehicle. Simple, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and that, that's a tank commander of Northwest Europe in 1944. <laughs> Another concept was born in World War II is the SAS or the Special Air Service. They were highly trained commanders, so the concept of what the SAS are today isn't what the SAS was when it was first born. They're raiding troops. They'll go far behind enemy lines and vehicles, cause as much havoc and mayhem as possible. And they're very good at it. Come to the latter part of the war, out the Tunisian campaign, the North African campaign, start again. Out the North Africa campaign, through Tunisia, into Sicily, Italy, they then made their way to Northwest Europe. So as you see, our SAS trooper is now in Northwest Europe. Instead of wearing a Denison smock, he's got a windproof smock. It's getting very do what I like with the SAS at this point. He's, he fights light. Why? Because he's working from a vehicle. So he's con they're working with jeeps constantly. Because by 1945, they're being used as like an armoured reconnaissance. So all he has is his Thompson submachine gun, a pistol, and literally inside his smock will be ammo, ammo and grenades. That he's jumping off vehicles left, right, and centre. <laughs> And I will now hand you over to the capable hands of Dominic Bly of Living History UK. Thank you very much, Peter Hill from Living History UK, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the end of the Second World War, the British Empire starts to decline. And as part of this, several wars are being fought around the world. So here, we have Private Tehran of the 1st Battalion Royal Rhodesia Regiment. 1959, the independence movements of several Central African countries start coming to fruition. So, he is equipped for the African climate. He is wearing a jungle green uniform made of light cotton. So in the African climate, a very, very uh, comfortable uniform to be wearing. 
who wears a denim jacket. Again, lightweight, but a bit more hard wearing than the um, than cotton. He wears the same web equipment his father probably wore in the last war. Same as his rifle, the number four, Lee Enfield. Most of the, uh, of the colonies in Africa were getting, well, they weren't being kept up to speed with the progression of military equipment that the rest of Britain um, and larger colony, well, nations such as Canada and Australia were seeing. So as a result, they were being handed down the old tack from the last major conflict. So again, well, even to the extent that the, uh, that the respirator he is issued with to counter stuff like tear gas and what have you in a riot situation, it is still the, the same respirator that was still being used in the early part of the Second World War. Yeah. Turn uh, face to your right. On his side, he has the number nine bayonet. And a wonderful part of national service of the British Army, as he's a national serviceman, well, because not major, major wars are being fought at the minute, the soldiers need something to do. So a bayonet like this is a bit more soldier-like, and therefore, you know, makes a soldier feel a little bit more soldierly when he's not polishing curbstones, etc. Again, he's, he's got a light set of equipment. He'll be working out of a vehicle such as a Land Rover or a Bedford lorry. Um, and he'll be working a lot of the time in towns, being aid to the civil power. Um, so essentially a bit of a militant police force by this point. So yeah, that is the soldier of the 1950s to the early 1960s, everybody. Next, we have a rifleman from the mid-1970s. He is equipped for Operation Banner in Northern Ireland. This is how the soldier will be equipped whilst walking around Belfast and other lovely places such as that. He has a flat jacket on with cl such close quarter fighting, building to building, a short range, he needs that to protect himself. Before, you have nothing. Now, the army are trying to look after the blokes by giving them some form of protection. He wears a camouflage jacket, a lot of green trousers, and he has the brand new rifle. No, I'm more or less brand new at this point. The L1A1 self-loading rifle. That's sort of about it, really. <laughs> and now, we have the modern day, post-2000. We have two riflemen, one representing 2005, the Iraq war, and on the right, 2010 in Afghanistan. Much more, they're not weighed down as heavily as their predecessors. They're not, yes, they are doing routine patrols around towns, etc. But they are still fighting from vehicles. They're not, out, they're not laden down with the extreme amount of, of weight as we've seen over the past 230 years because they don't need to carry stuff like boot brushes, you know, spare socks uh, all the time, toothbrushes and all that cobblers because they're working out of an area, working out of a vehicle. So the equipment itself is designed for the vehicle in mind. There's nothing hanging really, apart from his gloves, below the waist. <laughs> it is all hanging high quite up, so when he sits in the back of an armoured vehicle, or a Land Rover lorry, etc., it doesn't encumber him, especially when he, um, in, his, in a situation where he needs to exit the vehicle quickly. They're both armed with more or less the same rifle, the SA-80, which has a history which some people may know, being an interesting thing. But again, a modern rifle for a modern time. And that's more or less it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, 230 years. British soldier. And there you go. So that is the timeline of what you've seen while you've been here today. We hope you've really enjoyed yourselves, but Although we organised the event, the event wouldn't be possible if it weren't for these guys stood behind us in their respective groups. So give them a massive round of applause. <laughs> so I hope you've enjoyed yourselves, and if you're coming back tomorrow, see you tomorrow. Safe journeys home, everybody.